to be there. Mm -hmm. So one more time. Hello, everyone. My name is Martin Dembski. I'd like to welcome you all to the 45th breakfast, till breakfast, Lodz, Poland. 246 in Poland. 46. Yes, 46, 246 ah, in, in Poland. Poland. 240, ah, 46. Okay, so yeah, it's 45th in Lodz and 246 in, 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 in Poland. Um, as some of you may already know, Łódź used to be a multi multicultural city before Second World War. Um, and we want to relate to this history. That is why this is going to be the first uh, English speaking breakfast, uh, including some international guests. And I give them a warm welcome. Let me also introduce you briefly to uh, Till Breakfast Poland Initiative. It happens both nationally and uh, locally. It is meant to create a space where we can get inspired, reflect, exchange. Exchange our experiences, knowledge, practices with like-minded people in safe, inclusive, and uh, full of respect environment. We are interested in the subject of how we can reinvent the way we work the way we manage, or better to say, the way we lead, because personally, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of word manage. I prefer word to lead. Reinvent the way we combine our path to wholeness with tangible business effects. We reflect here on when and why we should do that. And also upon what are the challenges and limits of this approach. As I've already mentioned today, we have our first international breakfast, which personally makes me very proud of, very excited, very curious, especially because of the fact that we are hosting a great steel leader, and I have no doubt about it. Founder of QTIL, who is fixing systems, not people. And frankly speaking, I love that approach. I deeply believe that people do not need to be fixed. They are not broken. They only need to find their natural, where, where they naturally fit in. 13 years ago, Jan moved from the field of reinventing software applications to the field of reinventing business organization models. He managed to go through almost every color that is described in spiral dynamic model. Finally, he reached the point of building no paper, no email, set your own wage, unlimited holidays, and only pay when happy organization. Sounds like a dream. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a dream. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, For is. some, it may sound like a fairy tale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> However, personally, I had this privilege to ask Jan many questions about that, also including those inconvenient ones. And I have to admit that he has a firm arguments to back it up. Uh, I can say that uh, he simply talked the talk and walked the walk. For me, he's an abundant source of uh, great experiences. And what's most important, very eager to share them with others. That is why, dear ladies, uh, dear gentlemen, don't be shy and take opportunity to ask him anything. Anything you really want, because that's a great opportunity in my eyes. Without further delay, ladies and gentlemen, Jan van Lishout from QTIL. Let's give him a warm welcome. Hey, thank you. Jan, Martin. the floor is yours. Thank yes. you. And, and just to be sure, it's uh, 9.20 right now. Uh, the breakfast usually ends around what time? 11. OK, so we're going to leave plenty of room for, for questions. But I also know myself a little bit that whenever I start talking, there's so many topics to cover. Uh, I, I like to rabbit hole a little bit, so I have to be uh, careful about this. Uh, rabbit holing is you start some part and then before you know it, you're talking about something else. And um, I'm not natively English speaking, so I hope that also helps that uh, the words I'm using are quite straightforward. Uh, but my Polish is way worse than your English. 
So whenever you want to ask something, do ask in English or check with Marcin in, in, in Polish and he can translate. And uh, let's, let's get the interaction uh, especially going. Um, we are also building out a community uh, on Instagram and on LinkedIn, uh, especially for QTL, because we would like to show on one side, and that's more the Instagram uh, side, where we show the behind the scenes, what's happening uh, with our team. Uh, we're not selling anything. If we're selling something, it's our way of working a little bit, but it's not going to cost you anything. It's just uh, feedback and, and input. And on LinkedIn, um, it's also showing a bit the behind the scenes, but more also sharing some of the processes we delivered um, for other people to pick up and maybe also to improve. Because I truly believe in whenever you invent something, don't keep it for yourself, just start sharing it. And then others might pick it up and even improve it and give you some feedback on that one. So if you want to scan those, uh, be, be my guest. That's maybe the only thing I'm asking because we would like to uh, uh, build out the community. At the end, I have the QR codes uh, again. So let's see how I can do this best. Because something is blocking a little bit my screen. One second. Is this still readable? I think yes. Like um, if the letters are that size, it would be readable. Just show hands if it's if it's if it's not okay. Yeah? Otherwise, I'll, I'll change a little bit. Or you okay. can write in the chat as well. It's yeah? better. Okay. No. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about what we do as a company. It's more how we do it in, in a company, uh, because basically we are a, a software uh, services organization uh, working in a very specific niche of embedded software quality. And embedded software quality, that's the software which is running on chip level. So you might have something what we have worked on because it's built into devices, into iPhones, into your car or something else. That's actually what we do to bring in revenue. So we are not an organization that is uh, seeking for revenue to give deal consultancy, but we like to share a lot about those things. Uh, um, so that's who I am. And thanks for, for quoting a little bit, the fixing systems, not people. Uh, we are the, all our cars or our company cars are having the same logo like this. And when we're traveling a bit around Europe, when people are watching us and they give a comment, it's not about our company name. It's always about the payoff or the slogan uh, underneath. And we just ordered a new batch of cars, uh, of course, fully electric. And uh, we also decided marketing-wise to lower QTL as a kind of a logo and to increase it a little bit, really the slogan, because people really love it like that. Um, and at least like you said, Marcin, it's, I don't expect to change people. And I like to be naive enough to think people are good, but they might act differently because they were used to work in the wrong system. So what the focus on, if something happens bad with a person at work or anything, Look at the system first, why this happens. Uh, uh, but that by itself, thinking about the rabbit hole, it could already be a totally different talk. Um, so my goal at the end is, if you felt that we lowered the threshold, that you can reach out to me via LinkedIn or any way, so we can have more talks, even at your company. Uh, I'm always willing to do so because I like to share those things. I got a few topics lined up over here. Uh, I'm not going over those topics right now. Um, in, in a live session, I like to do some voting to see if we're getting short in time, what are the topics you like to cover the most? So we set the agenda on the spot. Now it's gonna be a little bit too hard doing this virtual. So I'm gonna try to cover actually everything what we have over here. 
One important takeaway, and this was even before I started building out the Teal organization. Um, I, I worked for about 20 years for an American-based company, really in very orange-like, uh, you know, the colors, uh, the colors of, of uh, Frederick Laloux. Right? So it has nothing to do with oranges. It's just an orange uh, type of company. Um, but over there, especially American companies, they work with vision and mission and strategy. And I noticed that a lot of them are looking at those things as a marketing thing. And marketing is building the vision and the mission and it, and it rings quite well and it sounds quite well and people feel attracted to it. Uh, but then I also learned when you, when you scrape it off a little bit uh, that also some of them really have a deeper meaning why they had that vision and why they, they, they have this mission. Um, and I truly believe that that's the very, very first thing you need to build for yourself if you build a new organization or if you have an existing organization, revisit your vision mission if it makes sense. If it really resonates to the people and the customers you have and the suppliers and also what you do. And a very simple trick is sometimes to yeah, uh, I, have, I have a can over here, uh, which could say, okay, that's a marketing thing. Oh, uh, that's a marketing thing. But even the can itself, what you do marketing-wise, need to fit in your vision and your mission. Uh, so ordering a new batch of USB memory sticks, I, I would always tell marketing people, say, yeah, and what's your, what's your message? Yeah, it's, it's a nice gadget. Yeah, but what's really your message? How does it relate back to your company? And it starts with vision and mission. And, and the small trick I always do is like, uh, your vision is something where you would say, I see a world where, and then you complete the sentence. And that's not wrong. That's not right. It's your opinion how you see the world. And what we see is that if you have a group of people or any person, and that person is actually happy in what they are doing, you will also see that the end result, so the product or whatever that person delivers, is actually better than when this person would not be feeling happy about this. This is just yeah, facts what you see. And when people are really dedicated on something is because they like doing this, it makes them happy. That's our vision. So, what we like to do, and that's where the fixing systems comes, comes in, is let's look for systems influencing the happiness of those people and start improving those. And we continuously improve those systems, making people happier so they can create exceptional products. And that's a very clear thing you can also easily remember. And based on that one, we, we created some core values that are really the foundation to be able to pull off what we want to do. Uh, I will not explain all of them, just mention them, but we go for 100% transparency. And when I say 100%, it will pop up later on. Everything is visible, what we do in the organization, the good news, but also the bad news. We expect people to take ownership on what they do, but we also don't expect them to uh, manage everything. Uh, they need to show some leadership on things uh, or do everything themselves. They need to work in partnership with others, internal, externals, uh, and, and so on. And authenticity is one for me that's, that's quite important because I notice, especially being suited up with, with, a, with, with a tie and a, and, a, and a costume and everything, uh, with a suit going to work, uh, I've been wearing suits for many, many, many years. But isn't it strange that uh, if you're at yourself at home or with friends, you're not suited up. And then if a company is requesting you to say, now you need to wear a suit, you're actually not being yourself anymore. You already need to act slightly different. And authenticity for me is really, you need to be yourself at work, but also take the decisions as if those were personal decisions. A very simple question I ask doing investments is like, would you do this yourself 
if you had the money at home? If it's a yes, then by all means do so. And the last one is to uh, continuous improvement. I see a lot of people always analyze, 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 question things before they actually take a decision. We like to take a decision fast. Don't be upset if it's the wrong decision or it needs to be improved because afterwards you go and learn and you go into a continuous improvement. Too many companies are waiting to take their decisions, which is always a bad thing. Not deciding is the worst thing what you can do. So I have a kind of a step-by-step -step program. How we said at that time, if we would reinvent an organization based as we would develop a product, uh, what would we do? Um, so I did put on a bit, how do you say this? My, my um, yeah, I can't translate it right now. That's a bit of a bad thing. We said, you, you, your naughty shoes, we say in, in, in Belgium, we say, I'm, I'm not going to be restricted in anything I say. I'm just going to uh, bluntly mention it to everybody. Um, but I said, if you want to change something, the first step you need to take is to actually drop existing tools you have and drop existing rules you have. Way too often, we are getting influenced by, uh, oh yeah, let's do sales. I'm gonna buy a sales tool, uh, a CRM tool. By doing so, the tool will influence you already in thinking like the way the tool was designed for you to think. Same thing, there are so many rules out there, legislation or company rules or whatever rules, um, and in many cases, it's not clear anymore. Why did we have those rules? Uh, so my approach over here, just stop it, drop them, and go to the next level where we say like, what was the initial pain and what's the need you really have to have that one fixed? Then think about what you think, not anybody else. What do you think, how we can actually solve this? And you do this in a team, you listen to everybody's input, and you will see quite quickly, and that's why I have uh, this guy over here uh, guiding everything. There are many external factors influencing you. Yeah, but there's a rule, and my mom said, and my previous job, they said, that's the way to fix it. Try to put it aside and think, what would you do with a blank sheet of paper? Based on this, I mentioned the values, and that's why I spend a little bit of time on those values. In anything you do at the end, our guys, we have an idea how we can fix this pain, but does it still map with the values we have? And sometimes by the external influence, you might come to a conclusion where if you start mapping it to your values, say, yeah, but that's not us. That's not authentic. That's not a partnership value. That's not taking ownership. No, we don't improve anything. So re-question those things. Step five, build your own process. Do the kind of the first draft of your own process. How would you change uh, something if you want to tackle the initial pain? That's it. But I mentioned drop existing tools and rules which doesn't mean that there are no rules. Uh, that's the next step where we say, you know what? Now we have something. Now I'm going to validate those things ex uh, against existing rules and maybe some of the regulations. Uh, I'm going to give a small example because it's quite fresh. Um, in the five years time, uh, we never fired anybody. We never stopped anybody's contract. Uh, except a while back. But then again, there are many rules how you do this. You stop a contract and you need to do A, B, C, and D. We said, we're not going to do this. We're just going to have a kind of a, a very clear talk where they said, I think you're not happy in this organization because we don't really have the role that fits your capabilities and interests. 
And you can look for a new role within the organization. And of course, we already did before. I think now it's time to look for a new role that makes you happy. And if this is in an external organization, let us help you in finding that new role. Um, that's a very strange process. And two days ago, this person said, yeah, I signed up somewhere else and I'm very happy about this. And, and, and they're also very ha happy about the whole approach. And yes, it took maybe hmm, two weeks longer than if I would have done the official process, like we're gonna stop the contract and now it's your issue. We're not, uh, we, we can pay you out. No, we, step, we kept on helping that person. Feels way better for us. You still have a good relationship, but at the end, that person will be more happier in a new role in this other company. So we are validating those things. Uh, even this one said, mm, did I do something wrong? Can an external instance now come to me and say, ah, oh, no, that's not the way to stop a contract. We are challenging that a little bit, uh, but still we are validating if those things are correct. Which is bringing me to step seven. Are we in compliance? Sometimes there are systems, outside systems telling us what you do is not correct because there are rules. Uh, and of course, we are checking if we are in compliance with those, uh, if we are still uh, obeying to those rules. If that's a yes, fine. Uh, so step five, we have a process. And with that process, we go to external parties and we explain them. This is what we want to do. What do you think? Uh, if we go too early to those external parties, they will always say, no, 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 you can't do this. You're not allowed to do those things because there are existing processes. By doing this, you might end up with something completely different. So if, if it's a yes, just continue. Of course, there will also be a no. Many companies at that time would say, oh, it's a no, let's go back to, to the existing rule. What we do is, uh, okay, it's a no. If we still do it, will we get a penalty? Money-wise or whatever. Uh, can I go to jail if I do those things? Uh, um, same thing over there. If it's a no, there's no penalty. Uh, you're not in compliance, but there's no penalty. It's amazingly how many rules are out there where you say, there's a rule for a reason, but when I break the rule, there's no penalty. So why do you have that rule? Doesn't make any sense. Uh, so again, no penalty, just continue. If it's a yes, then it already becomes a little bit more tough. But still, then we ask, if we still do it, what, what, what will be the cost of that penalty? And will the cost of the penalty be higher than what we think the value it will bring? And value is not only money, value is also, it's worth it to us. We think it's a good thing to do. And for good things, we like to spend some money too. Which is, by the way, a very hard thing to talk to accountants or lawyers about this uh, and bankers. Uh, a banker person, an accountant and lawyer, they, they think in liabilities and they think in money. If you say a happiness of a co-worker is worth a lot of money, they cannot see this in a spreadsheet. You cannot measure happiness. You can measure revenue and cost and see how much money it brings. It's hard to measure happiness as a tangible money thing for accountants. So here we do uh, the final check. And this is the outcome. I said, is the cost of the penalty greater than the value it brings? No, we're still gonna do it. Uh, tell to the accountant or whoever feels a little bit uneasy about the penalty, just make a budget for that penalty because we will pay even proactively if it, there's a fine or something. But if we don't do this, we will fall into the existing rules and the existing processes and we don't change anything in this world today. If it's a yes, and you feel like or, as, as an organization, yeah, wait, 
it is bringing some value, but the cost and the impact is too big, which is also not a healthy thing. It will create stress. But we will go to uh, step five and redesign our process a little bit. And you can apply this to many, 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 many things. Uh, just if you want to make a change, just try to do this. And you will see that sometimes you come up with something completely different than the initial fix you had in mind. Um, so based on this and using uh, the previous thing, um, in our project, we work the Scrum Agile methodology way of working. Um, I don't think I need to explain it, but I'm showing it very quickly because we are approaching a company and the operational side of the company as a product. We are delivering a product and in this product, there will be product backlog tickets, things that need to happen. And we try to deliver every single time, which is also in two weeks time, something new, which has to do with the operations of the organization. Yeah. Um, I'm sharing the presentation afterwards. So I'm not going over all these things, but it's kind of a good exercise where what you can do if you look at product, product backlog and so on, all the different elements within uh, the agile way of working that you can map it to something which is not that tangible as a product. So I'm going to pick <clears throat> two things. The product itself is anything we do in the organization, even the operational work is part of a deliverable product. The way we pay an expense, the way we end a contract, and so on and so on. <clears throat> when we do a retrospective at the end, we talk to our clients, which is also external clients, uh, suppliers, uh, our co-workers to see, guys, we showed you how we work. What do you think we need to improve? And those improvements are becoming new backlog tickets to, in, uh, to improve our own system of working. <clears throat> so about this, still have some coffee. So how does it visually look? This is of course a mock-up what you see. <clears throat> If you know a Kanban board or you know uh, uh, the post-it tickets, I have something to do and I'm going to put a post-it on the wall and then you start moving it from columns. But I said, I, I got a lot of things in to do. Um, and this is more related to getting things done, of course, uh, also uh, a methodology to get things done to uh, uh, a number set of stages. Anything we do, and really anything, anything, so even this presentation, what I'm doing right now, was a ticket in my to-do, till breakfast Poland, and it's going through some stages. And one of those stages today, I'm, I'm doing the, the actually processing and delivering, and uh, this afternoon, I will be able to put it on done. But I had to prep something. We had some uh, pre-meetings. I'm also linking all those meetings. I'm also booking my time on it. So people are fully transparent and see like, oh yeah, huh? is this worthwhile doing those things? But this is the way it's gonna look. <clears throat> Any ticket is in our backlog, which could be a very simple expense, could be somebody's wage, could be an opportunity, could be a recruitment, could be a candidate who wants to join us, or could be a pain or an issue. Something did go wrong, and that's the nicest thing. You have a very first version, you put it live, and then something doesn't work very well. And instead of fixing it on the spot, so just make an issue ticket, as if it's a bug in the operational way of working. And this issue ticket will be picked up, and then we develop the, uh, a method and also a platform that we can on the spot document our stages what we do i think in the first stage we need to analyze second stage we need to uh, develop something and demo it and then in the last stage you say uh, it's accepted it's actually done 
And it gives a very nice feeling also for people to be able to drag tickets to this Kanban board. And of course, the guidance we have is don't use too many tickets at the same time. Uh, that's where also the no email policy, yes. Uh, we, we do have an email address. That's one thing the outside world is expecting every coworker to have an email address, but we never send emails uh, among each other. We have zero emails being sent among each other. We do send emails towards customers because we cannot influence their way of working, but we are sending emails out of a ticket. So not by our email program, but because of uh, we have a ticket, so we are sending emails out of the context of the ticket itself, which is great afterwards. Uh, so same thing, Marcin, we talked about this session. Uh, there is a ticket. If after three years I go back to that ticket, I can see all the history, all the mails we had, all the talks we had, because I'm getting older, so I might forget a few things. When I read those things back, then it's all clear again. Um, and otherwise, yes, I know it would also be in my email box somewhere, but for me, it didn't work. So let me give you an example. And we didn't intend to do it that way, but it ended up by being a different process than the existing processes. Maybe you can all relate to the following. At the end of the month, HR, is going to verify everybody's timesheets or absences to be able to process the wages. And you want to get paid out at the end of the month for I worked. And in many cases, I don't know if that's an international rule, around the 26th, 27th, they like to pay out the wages. Um, I hope uh, that's kind of a, the general rule what they have. But you will always have people who are a little bit behind of having their absences or their timesheets sorted out. And then you always have to find this one person, Amo, I'm gonna use you as a kind of a, an example. You're not the one, but I know you personally. Amo is always late. Uh, so HR say, Amo, can you please uh, fill out your timesheets or your absences? Because we would like to process the wages in batch. Because that's the way people think it's more effective to group everything together and do all the wages at the same time and then do the next step, do all the pages at the same time and then do the next step and then do the next step. Now, for the employee point of view, some people are very strict and they say, oh, by the 25th of the month, my timesheets will be okay, my absences will be okay. I'm very good at this, I'm ready. But my page will only get paid if the last timesheet uh, of the last person and wage is processed. So we shifted that process around. Uh, again, looking at fixing systems, not people. Is uh, Because fixing the people would be like, hey, Amo, you need to be faster. You need to be faster. Next time you need to do it the 25th, Otherwise, uh, we're going to fine you or we're going to punish you on those things. That's trying to fix a person. If you fix a system, then you can think about how can I deliver the most value to a person? And value to a person is to a person itself. So it's a, a person is doing something. And you're reacting to it so you can deliver something. So at the end, this person feels like, oh, yeah, people responded to my request. And I didn't have to wait five, six, seven, eight days before I got anything back to me. So this early request and response is, is important to us. So how does it look for us? Oops, sorry, that's not what I want to do. I'm going to show it immediately. You see... It is more complex. It's more lines. It's more people getting involved. So in Qtil, maybe so you don't start reading everything. At any time in the month, from the first day of the month, any employee, they can submit their wage ticket, remember the ticket, huh, to be processed. 
And then we work as a team because on the employee side of things, they say like, I know when I'm going to be absent. Uh, I have it filled out in the system. My wage ticket is groomed enough. Uh, it's, it's ready. Absences are in there. It's good to go. So employee, part of the team, did their job. Then the social office. In Belgium, we have social offices, uh, kind of an existing rule I cannot, uh, I cannot drop, that an external office is doing the, the, the wage calculation. Uh, which for me is okay. That's a, that's a level of partnership. They are the expert in making wage calculations. And they say, you know what? Within 24 hours, uh, your pay slip will be ready and prepared and calculated and, and so on. It gets back in. So operations in the company say, okay, we're getting the payment details. Uh, they do match the ticket, uh, this wage ticket right now. Uh, it is validated. It's good for us to go. There's kind of a mapping. The finest person uh, who's speaking of the finance role is just looking at that wage ticket at the moment as, ah, I'm having some expenses to pay from suppliers. And this one is a wage ticket, which is actually just an expense. This finance person doesn't care that it's somebody's wage. It's just an expense, so it goes with the flow. Uh, it's passing through those, through those stages. And then the employee at the end, uh, when everything is paid, they receive a kind of a ping in our own uh, internal system, kind of a, like a WhatsApp message, but in our own uh, internal system to say, uh, listen, uh, your wage with that amount is paid on this date. And by the way, I preferred, uh, I've prepared a new ticket for next month. So you already have a new wage of April tickets uh, in your backlog. So if you want to make that one ready, you're good to go. You see, it's a lot more steps what we take over here. But the throughput, or let's say the duration for a single person is much shorter. And the value to that person is, is much higher. And although we did it to make the people happier, we also get a very good response from this external social office over here. Because they, that's an external company only doing wage processings. And of course, at the end of the month, they have a huge peak of work of all the companies demanding their wage processing. And we are kind of a, yeah, a different kind of organization where at any time in the month, one single wage could be processed. And their systems can handle it, but they never expected us to ask something like this. And in the beginning, they said, yeah, but it's not effective. Why would you do this? And then after two months, they came back to us and said, this is great. We hope that every company would do this because now our workload balance within the month would be evenly spread if everybody would be doing this. Now in the middle of the month, we have too many people at work. And at the end of the month, we don't have enough people because there's too much work to be done. And you can apply the same thing to your invoicing. Uh, people are used and accountants are used to pay invoices at the end of the month or to send out invoices at the end of the month. We send out an invoice when we deliver it. If this is the Tuesday of the first week, is this the Friday of the second week, we send it out. So we're spreading our invoices towards uh, the external systems. This brings me to, in that way of working, how can we, then also towards our customers, focus on bringing value instead of bringing a certain commitment or just doing some time and, and, and having it paid by them. Um, in the same approach, you try to talk to your customers, say, what do you want me to do? Yeah. And what it's worth to you and how fast do you need it? And you know that quality, is a bit of the combination of you have a certain scope. What should it do? What's the outcome? The customer might say, and I have a certain budget to do this. And 
I need to have it at a certain time. You can't have three of them at the same time with the highest importance at the, at the same level because the quality itself will be a kind of a balance between the three of them. And, and once you put a little bit more balance on, let's take the bottom one first, it cannot cost that much and I need to have it fast. Then you will know that if it's cheap and fast, you must agree that the quality will not be good. In some cases, maybe it's, it's, it's good enough, yeah? but that's the kind of the result. Yeah. If you say, no, it's cost and scope eh, in what we do. Yeah, if you don't, eh, if you just have a limited budget and still we need to deliver something very specific, we cannot make the promise in how fast we will do this. Eh? It will take time because the cost is fixed and the scope is fixed. And what we mainly focus on is uh, the scope and time, Axel, where we say, listen, if you want to have a real, really fast delivery, and time is important to you, uh, we will deliver the scope what you uh, agreed upon, but it might cost more. And our model, what we did, is a bit based on this, which doesn't mean we do fast delivery and we ask more, but it is based on, let's be smart about the scope uh, and let's be fixed on the time, but we will be variable on the cost itself. And I explain it to you right now, how this part is working. Again, uh, also seven steps. I think the other one also had seven steps. First thing what we do over here is every two weeks, fix time. And we really stick to the every two weeks. We inherited that one from um, the agile uh, scrum-based way of working in sprints. So the two weeks is the duration. We will decide on our side how much time we are putting into it. If we are increasing the team with 200%, it's our decision. Uh, it also goes in, in both directions. If we can pull it, pull it off with a smaller team, it's in our benefit. But as a kind of an upfront agreement we have, customer, we will deliver something in two weeks. In those two weeks, we have a fixed price. So we're going to put your cost as a fix. That's the way we start. Uh, and we're going to deliver something new a new scope. We agree on that scope. So for the customer, it's now clear. Okay, yeah, we agreed on the scope. That's a new product. I can expect something in two weeks time. And I can estimate already because if in those two weeks, that's the product you're going to deliver, I also know the cost, so it's fixed. So in a way, we have those three a bit in balance. But then that's where the value-based pricing gets, uh, gets in play. When we deliver, we are really asking our customer, remember two weeks back, you expressed what you expected as a new product, the scope part. How do you feel today? And you can have full transparency if that can feed your thoughts a little bit. But we gave a demo. Uh, we did the delivery presentation. What's your feedback and what's your delivery percentage? And that's the key giveaway over here. We allow our customers to say, Ma, no, you didn't get the scope at all. I'm not agreeing on that one. It's a 0%. I'm not paying. I'm not happy. Uh, it's, it's not okay. Um, so they are giving their percentage. And we do not go into any negotiation like, yeah, but it should be a little bit higher because uh, you don't realize how much work, again, time we have put into it. Um, we don't do those things. We, the feedback is much more uh, important. Then we also invoice 
that percentage of our price to that customer. Behind the scenes, it happens slightly different because with that customer, you work with uh, product owners and they agree on everything and that's clear. But uh, we work for very big companies where they work with purchase order numbers. And when they get just a percentage of a certain PO, they would be completely uh, messed up in their head. So we have a separate system uh, to handle those things uh, so that we are not making it too complex for other instances. But bottom line, the customer will only pay for the percentage that they felt is actually delivered. And then using that feedback, we improve for the next sprint what we're going to do based on that feedback. So one of the questions we might ask if somebody says, ah, I think it's an 80% or 60%. I said, OK, what do you expect us to do differently next time? so we can reach or go towards the 100%. And then it's up to the customer to give us advice, and especially on the, the scope probably, or maybe on the quality overall, uh, so we can get that percentage up. And that's the thing we repeat. So that's an important seventh step. Um, the first time, for instance, when we do this, for sure, we know internally that we spend much more time internally on this because we're building a kind of a, a, a way of working that let's go for the scope. We would like to deliver the scope what we promised. But I always tell customers at the same time is if we are able to deliver the scope and we used five people to do so, and after 10 times we are able to deliver exactly the same scope and we only use three people to do so, does it have the same value to you? And if you ask it that way, they will say, yeah, it's the same value. And then say, okay, even if we were able to do it with three people instead of five, and then they have to be honest with themselves and say, yes, okay, then we also have a deal. If you find a customer say, no, 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 because three people is less than five, so I want to pay less, then that, that's probably not the right customer for you. So this worked very well for us. <laughs> a lot of people, uh, exist, existing rules and existing opinions outside, they say, yeah, but you're going you're gonna to lose so much money on this. Um, customers will take advantage of it. Because automatically they're gonna say it's zero or it's it, it's it's uh, it's less. <clears throat> but like uh, we said in the beginning, fixing fixing systems not people. I believe that a person a person is not like that. That he would negotiate every single time. I rather believe in partnerships, where they believe like okay, we're working together for multiple times. That's why I said it has to happen minimal ten times. So that nowadays, yes, sometimes you are getting an 80%, even a 60%. Uh, because by the way, we're also absorbing absences like holidays. We invoice exactly the same thing or the scope is exactly the same thing. And it could be that part of the team is just on holiday. And then this customer might say like, oh yeah. And it's not because you were on holiday. It's because that the delivery was less than before, and that's why I'm giving a lower percentage. But we also have cases that we are getting 120% and 150%. And that's a part where people set up front, they're never going to do this. A customer will never give you more than 100%, and we have the proof that it is, it is happening. And overall, it is balancing out a little bit. Uh, it's not kind of a, a, a tricky sales trick what we're doing. It's balancing out and it's a fair model. It's a very transparent model. Now, some, some lessons learned. Um, we, we are an engineering company. So we have a, a lot of yeah, blue energy. Uh, it needs to be correct. It needs to be uh, uh, very strict. Uh, I'm more kind of a yellow person, if you know the color codes with the, the yellow, red, 
not the red of Lalu, but the red of personality uh, models uh, and the blue and the green. Uh, as a team setup, I also look like a, a fair balance. Uh, not too many red people, because everybody has a portion of, of a red personality in them if they get into a stress situation. But a fair balance between yellow balanced out with blue and, 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 and some green, what everybody needs to have a little bit. Um, what we noticed is that we have more uh, at the moment a model and the technology and the platform that we could easily grow to 400, 500 people. But one of the pitfalls is when you're small, you tend to talk everything through with everybody and try to get to a common agreement with everybody. Really, we, we call it the consensus mode. Are we not sure? Uh, let's do a vote. Uh, and if everybody agrees, it's, it's kind of a nice vote. But then you see if, if two people are not agreeing, people say, yeah, then, then I'm not going to decide anything. Uh, so what we found as a kind of a, uh, a pitfall was that we were trying to please everybody in the organization and getting into consensus. And a small example was uh, at a certain time we were buying new monitors and somebody said, oh, yeah, I, will, I, will, uh, I will order them, it's a ticket, let's get some feedback, what kind of monitor, uh, what will be the price, what will be the cost, and, and so on. But then you start talking about the specifications of a monitor. And this should have been a very nice process where everybody liked doing this. At the end, nobody liked it anymore. It's like, yeah, I don't want to monitor anymore. Too many discussions about the size, about the pixels, about whatever. And, and some people say the energy level is important. So you really need the level of leaders in the organization too, who say, listen, I picked up that ticket. I'm going to do that ticket. I will ask you for some feedback on my proposal and I will ask you for advice. But at the end, I will also process that advice and take a decision and, and spend my time on, I took a decision, what can be improved next time, instead of spending your time like trying to please everybody and get to a consensus mode. Um, so that's important. The other part is um, our wages are 100% transparent. Anything is 100% transparent. Not everybody can handle the truth behind the scenes, even external parties. If you build out a company, and uh, the nice example is I made a, a cash flow report that I expected us to go to minus 200,000 euros in three months time, which is normal, which is completely normal that that would happen. If people see like, hey, we're in the debt of 200,000 euros after two months time, they might be afraid. And even very experienced accountants and others say, hey, hey, your business is not going well. And that's a bit of a pity because any business who's, who's starting up and is doing an investment, they will go very negative in the beginning. But people's egos, they don't like to talk about those things. It's like dealing on the stock exchange. You only hear the positive things like, look how much money I made on the stock exchange by buying and selling these stocks. But you know, there are an equal amount of people who lost money. And you never hear them talk about those things. Huh? I'm making all those things transparent. And sometimes it's very hard to defend it and to explain it again and say, no, this is okay. So you might feel the urge to say, you know what, it's too early. Let's not make it transparent right now. Uh, that would be the wrong decision. Keep it transparent. Take your time to also explain and understand the worries that people have when they look at things. <clears throat> and also invest in those things. Like if you make a wage transparent, it's a very dangerous thing if you don't put it in context. 
because I'm sure that's the same in Poland, that an employee, what they're earning net or what they're earning gross or what the cost is to the company are three totally different amounts. And then if an employee only thinks in the net amount and they see an invoice passing by of a freelancer, they might say like, hey, that doesn't make any sense. This is the amount I'm earning, and this is what a freelancer is earning. While the freelancer's cost is much closer to the third one over here, which is the total cost of ownership of an employee. And those are the things we completely explain to everybody to say, what's the cost of somebody? And let's start thinking that way. You need to train people to be able to be transparent. And that's why when you pick up something, uh, Teams above 20, even above 10 sometimes, it's hard to lead those things. Uh, create those small clusters based on a certain topic, let them work on this. And then the third one uh, over here, um, I've been guiding a lot of companies myself in merging and acquisitions, in, in uh, change management and so on and so on. But I was an external person helping them. And I thought personally that, oh yeah, now I'm gonna do it within QTL myself. Why would I hire somebody external? Because I've done it before, I can help them and I'm part of the team. The fact that you're part of the team, but also kind of an ex external guidance, it, it is a kind of a conflict in mode. So I would advise to get, even if you, think that you can handle it yourself to get external guidance whenever you feel like and rather early than late okay then this is more uh internal but it's to open up your uh, your mind a little bit on the possibilities there is profit what we make and profit most of the time goes to the shareholders. Uh, we created something which is called the crowdfunding reinvestment model, where any profit what we make will be shared. So how do we share it? Is that 20% is going to, let's say the shareholders, where again, for external shareholders, uh, accountants, bankers, they say, nobody's going to invest in your company if only 20% of the profit is going to the shareholder of the company. That's not enough. They like to have the whole uh, profit and be in control in what you invest. So what we did from day one, noted down in the uh, paperwork of the company is that at least 20% will always go to the employees. It's kind of the, the green model. We have a shared bonus. I'm not going to say it's still, it's the green model. We have a, a shared bonus. So 20% of profit is over there. A maximum of 20% is going to the shareholders. So they are getting some money in return for their investment. So the remaining 60%, we do put that part into an investment bucket. And that investment bucket, let's call it almost monopoly money, is shared within our tool with every single individual in the organization. Not based on their seniority, just based on the amount of time they work for the company, they get an equal share. Not to use it for their personal use, but to be able to invest in something. And so this 20% is purely personal use. That's what they get on their bank account. And this is opening up some very interesting models where you say like, okay, there are a few rules. With that investment model, anyone in the company, and even we also have an example, uh, somebody externally from the company, they can propose a crowdfund proposal. Uh, everybody knows crowdfunding uh, outside. Uh, we have it internally. We can do a crowdfund proposal. 
this this proposal could be like we need to buy something a machine uh we need to invest in the development of a project or uh, or a product what we are doing right now or even let's take a trip with the whole company to portugal what we did last year or uh, let's do a kind of a uh, an expensive training and remember in existing systems training would be a budget from hr or from a manager and i said oh yeah I, I think you need to go on training we took that budget and we say no we're not going to budget for that one it will be part of the investment because if people want to take training it's better that they propose a crowdfund proposal themselves and then also getting to the next one find other crowdfunders to fund it and then actually achieving the 100% budget and when they achieve the 100% budget they need to do that training or whatever crowdfund proposal it's a done deal there's no manager double checking there's no manager uh, approving that funding we just create a contract in our system we put the money in that one and they can spend it yeah and yes maybe sometimes accidents might happen because i always get this uh lame i uh, lame uh silly examples to say oh so if i find two co-workers uh, we can buy ourselves a, a ferrari and then um, and then we will have a ferrari in the organization because we were able to uh, invest it with the crowdfund budget yes that would be possible and then if say, yeah, and that's why this is a bad thing to do because you don't want to buy a Ferrari, do you? I say, no, I don't. But I'm also trusting people that they will not do this. If you start bringing down processes like this with silly ideas, what you just mentioned, you start already shielding the great idea. Uh, just give it a chance and improve if it becomes a pain. If then afterwards somebody said, yeah, Jan, it was a silly system because we ordered a Ferrari and we didn't need one. Okay, what do you guys think we need to do to prevent this? Huh? And then, yeah, this is what I just uh, explained. Somebody is owning that budget at the end if it's crowdfunded and they can do whatever they want to, I based, of course, uh, on their crowdfund proposal. And this works very well. This is really giving ownership to people. It's creating partnership because other people need to fund it. They need to be transparent on those things. And some very good lessons learned is if we think about the training in a, in a classical model, you think about what's the cost of training. I, it's a 500 euro training a day. I said, no, it's not only 500 euros. You're also going to the training. You're going with 10 people to the training. It's a different cost model. And then people also understand and value much more like, oh, damn, yeah, this is quite an expensive training. I want to be committed to it and really crowdfund that one because I'm committed. And you will see that the level of quality that people are attending trainings are much higher than somebody of HR who said, I subscribe you to this 500 euro training next week because they don't really see or feel the impact of that one. Okay, last one, and then I'm, then I'm, then I'm done, so we can be open for questions. Um, so this also had kind of a result that we could let our own employees, including myself, uh, uh, propose their own wage and also propose and decide on their own number of holidays they want to take. But there are a few uh, small requirements. If you want to do this, you cannot say like, oh, yeah, uh, the management, we are going to shield the, the, the wages and then the other people, we're going to make it transparent. All data needs to be transparent, really everything. So people can also see like, did we make a profit and uh, how are the projects going? And if we have a freelancer, how much is that person costing? Ah, there was a recruit and we made a kind of a calculation. What are the external data? What I'm missing? 
so people need to understand the data, what they are reading over there. Um, and you need to provide quite some reference materials. People like to compare. Um, and there's even a bigger drawback of not being transparent is that if you're not transparent and you don't have the reference materials, people will assume that somewhere else it's much better. And that's based on exactly the same thing. When they hear in the outside world, they will only hear the good stories like somebody's earning more, but they are never hearing the stories like somebody's earning less on those things because people are not really proud in saying those things. That's the ego talking again. So by doing this, data transparent, we all understand the data and we provide some reference materials so people can compare. We just trust people to propose uh, their wages. So what did we learn? Normally there's a manager proposing you uh, Amo, from next year on, you're going to get a 5% increase. And Amo can have, a, can have an opinion about this. They say, oh, yeah, I think it's nice, thank you very much. Or it's not enough, or it's too much. They will never say it's too much. Uh, if it's a manager and, and, and co-worker relationship. Um, <clears throat> we notice that it's way easier to have an opinion if somebody's offering you something instead of making a proposal yourself. Because now you have to reflect to yourself, say, oh, what is the value what I'm delivering to the organization? Because I'm going to also make it transparent to the rest of the world, hey, of the organization, what I think, what my value is. And this proposal to your peers, to your colleagues, really saying like, yeah, I'm, I'm asking 10%. This means that I'm 5% uh, higher than your wage, is putting some pressure on people. Like, ooh, ooh, is, is this okay? No. Uh, and also those things need to be tackled and you need to get to a level of trust and leadership that people are willing and feel confident to uh, propose the wage. And they also feel that it's safe to do those things. Um, we had one year where nobody was asking any increase. And I underestimated what was happening. Like, oh, is everybody happy with, uh, do they earn enough? So we also had a great year cost-wise and, and so on. Now this year, right, with the inflation and everything, people felt like, oh, no, no, I can't handle it anymore. So everybody, everybody was asking a, a very big increase, which is fair. But they were also making up a little bit for the past years. So what happened in that past year was like nobody dared to be the first. If nobody is asking, who's going to be the first to dare to ask? So one of the improvements we made is that uh, a wage increase can be requested by anybody. So I can say. Amo, I think it's time for you to create a wage increase, to make a proposal. And then I'm taking the initiative as a peer to say, Amo, I think looking at the numbers, why don't you do this? And then it's up to Amo to decide like, yeah, no, 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 I'm actually okay. But then the process, you're lowering the threshold a little bit. So now uh, at the minimum on a yearly basis, we create uh, a proposal for everybody, again, a ticket in the system, to propose my new wage. And then people can decide, let's analyze, do I want to have a new wage? Oh, yeah, let's propose, let's do some simulation, let's get some feedback, let's do my yearly review uh, with, with, with peers. Yes, do a proposal, or maybe no, I'm fine with it. We're not... Uh, selling this to the outside world, like, hey, look how great this is. Uh, we can have our own wages and we can have our own number of holidays because that would attract maybe a lot of people joining or wanted to join us for the wrong reasons. Again, because there's a kind of a bad system out there, which is telling you're only valuable in what you're getting paid, uh, what you're getting paid, the amount of, of money you get, 
and the number of holidays and so on and so on. I think it's just a very small part of the whole package what you get over here. But what are the facts <coughs> that, and I need to color it a little bit, of course, in Belgium, officially, officially, the minimum of holidays you have is 30, 10 public holidays, 20 uh, personal holidays. Uh, and then many companies are compensating for the 40 hour work da, 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 and, and so on, which is between six to 12 days. Um, so that would round up that in an official system, uh, the minimum would be 30. I think the average is going to be 36. And then some of them are 42. And some official instances, they have those crazy number of holidays where they are in, in the 50s. Our average is 38 days. Can I predict this in the beginning of the year? No, I can't. Does it make external systems uh, nervous because I cannot predict? Yes, it does, but you have to give it a little bit of trust that it will be okay. But this is also covering for the following. There are years that some people say, I don't need that many holidays because I'm okay. And then there are some years where somebody else say, yeah, I'm rebuilding the house. There was a new baby and da, da, da. I need some me time. So then we easily have this flexibility instead of, developing new processes and rules and so on. Um, of course, there are things, if you have a baby, there are some uh, days of leave, but it's all being used in the same system now. Um, and it actually started with an idea of people saying like, uh, Jan, I know I have the right to use, let's say 40 days, but I don't need those 40 days. Uh, can I give it to that coworker over there because he's in need because of the house and the kid and so on. And then you have to arrange a lot of official documents to make the transfer, to make it legal. So we change that system to say, we have a pool of holidays you can book. It's all transparent. It is unlimited. Uh, um, but by making it transparent, people will see like, oh yeah, uh, we, we're still okay. Because of course, if everybody takes a holiday, if everybody's taking 100 days of holiday, there's no business anymore. People realize this. It's the same story as the Ferrari thing. Uh, and on the other side, <clears throat> if you look at 2023, we had about a 9 to 16% wage increase. What you need to know, in Belgium, we have an automatic indexation, and the indexation was around 12%, which is an existing rule that we need to follow as an organization. Even that one, I said, no, we are not following that rule of the uh, outside processes. We're just giving you that one as an input that that would be the indexation in the classical company. Now you take the ownership and you deal with this. What, what do you want? Because the percentage is of course a percentage on an existing wage where sometimes it doesn't make sense. It's the absolute difference you need to compensate if you're talking about infl inflation and not a percentage difference. So we ended up with some people asking nine and the maximum asking 16, which, which is okay, which is okay. Okay. So 1028, Marcin, I hope that, that, that's, that that's okay. Yeah, that's uh, good timing, Jan. Thank you. So the, the last thing I really would like to say is my real goal is please do contact me or somebody of my organization. If you want to have a talk, if you want to have a presentation, if it's at your company, uh, for free. I just do those things for free because I believe in the long term, it will pay back in different ways. It doesn't have to be all about the money. So any questions? Maybe not question, but comment. After your presentation, I have an idea in my mind, mind that it's valuable to, um, uh, it's great to have a back company backlog, uh, open company backlog where we have tasks for in, in, to implement our company or do something 
in different way. Uh, and those tasks show what we need, uh, what kind of change we need in our organization and people can take uh, tasks from this board. So I think it's a great idea to have a um, system which collect all ideas uh, that we need to implement in organization to, to develop, to grow. So thank you for, and what do you think about this? Do you have something similar or? Yeah, uh, while you were saying this, uh, I'm sure you have seen in other companies, uh, because you're mentioning ID and box, uh, um, you have those, those physically ID boxes somewhere, uh, put an ID box. And I always thought something like that, that, that sounds like a black hole. Uh, you, you put something in there and it might maybe never pop up because mm -hmm. maybe somebody's reading it. So it, it is funny to see that it already exists, but the implementation is bad. While over here, it is a transparent ID box, which maybe starts with a pain. And this is encouraging the following. Uh, you don't have to come with solutions immediately. And maybe people think with an ID box, it's like, I have a new solution. And we try to start with, can we start with the pain first? It's good that you maybe already have a solution or a fix. But if it's a common understanding that other people always have, or also have this pain, then it's maybe better to start from that part and, and build it out. And and, and yes, for us, it works quite well that nothing is getting lost in, in, in those things. Uh, you need to set your expectations a little bit based on what kind of company you have. Uh, there is a threshold of people feel, feeling ready to pick up one of those tickets. That takes some time. And, and whenever somebody's picking one of those tickets, picking up one of those tickets, don't put pressure on them. And when are you going to deliver? Uh, expect zero, eh? expect nothing, and then anything you can expect afterwards. Yeah. And I think it's great to have this idea that, uh, th this idea is great that um, we have to, we need to have some agreement how to check if this idea or ticket is valuable for other, not only for me, so. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I can go next. Actually, I have two questions. Yeah. I will start with the one on the uh, on the uh, level of organization. Uh, you mentioned that system are important, and I'm completely agree. And thank you for sharing all the solution that you 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 are you you have implemented. And also, I'm really admiring the the um, your uh that you are so uh aligned with those that you you are just bringing into the world and and you are brave to bring into the world and to uh, to check if, how the world reacts uh said that uh about these systems um you 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 told that okay it's it's important to change and somehow to 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 um withdraw all the old systems and to have the new ones. In the same time, I'm thinking about the large organization when when it's difficult. I'm thinking about the uh, holocratic approach that once it was one 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 shot uh, constitution implementation and then going much more on modular way of doing. And um, I'm thinking of uh, my experience when we started the the, uh, the change in the same time sensing and responding with the system change what on what it's needed. So we were starting to change this system which was reclaimed by people. Uh, mm -hmm. So just your reflect. I I would like to to hear your reflection on this. Yeah 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 yeah. Um, so. So something I didn't mention, but it is important to, to know is if there is an existing organization and you try to change this existing org organization into a, a teal organization, it's very, very tough. And I would almost say it's impossible 
to, to, to do so. Um, they also call it is a company ambidexter. Uh, uh, ambidexter is that you can write in, in two directions with the, your left and your right hand, but that's also with a company. Can a company work at different speeds and different ways of working within one company? There aren't that you can do this. And if they do it, you will quickly see that they create a kind of a, a daughter company with their own PL, with their own management, because you need to cut the ties a little bit with the existing systems, what they have, because otherwise you're continuously uh, influenced. Uh, so so that, that, that's one part. That's also uh, when I was doing reorganizations at existing companies, I wouldn't go for the full teal setup. I wouldn't go for the full transparency setup because of the existing data they already have and the existing tools they already have. Mm -hmm. uh, this brings me to the tools. I do believe that what we have currently in, in our tool setup behind the scenes is the following. What we have built operationally is running in on the platform of force.com, so Salesforce, but not the CRM part, the engine but behind the scenes. That's uh, implementation wise. Uh, so we rely on uh, force.com. We rely on uh, the, the Google platform. That's it. And then for development, we do rely on, on Jira, but that's, that's uh, something else. Um, and of course, we also have an accountancy system. And this accountancy system is for legal reasons, it needs to be an external accountancy system or internally, but needs to be an accountancy system. But that system is only being fed via our process, what we do. Yeah. So at no time can anybody send invoices directly to the accountant and they will book it and, and, and so on. They are being fed by our systems. And what I've seen right now, and I can compare it to very big multinationals, that it's a more stable system what we have because it's based on a process which is touching almost everybody in the organization. And you don't have the ability to create silos. What I mean with a silo is financial department is doing something, marketing is doing something, sales is doing something, HR is doing something different. And, uh, and then they start sharing their own Excel sheets with each other. Because next to not using email, we also don't use Excel. Right? We don't have any Excel spreadsheet. Do we export data into Excel to play around? Yes, we do. Do we use Excel data as an input to a process? No, we don't. It all, there's always a single source of truth where it sits and we are very clear that's where it is. And you can have as many exports as you like, uh, but make it very clear where, where the data is sitting. And that's what I noticed in very uh, big multinationals that Every department had their own source of truth, of data. And then in very expensive director management VP levels, they try to come to an agreement. So what's the real truth? What do we have? They could never relate back to this single source of data. I, I hope it, it, it's, it's maybe not 100% an answer to your question, but does it help you a bit? A bit, yes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we can go and so another thank you. Another question is the, um, relating to the topic: how the teal companies can survive in the orange world, or generally the non-teal world. Um, and I see the the pattern in your what you are doing that you are yourself and you are testing the limits of the system outside. Mm. How do you say it? Yes, uh, it's actually one of the slides I, I removed because I, I noticed uh, in the in our Teal Around the World session, it, it was taking a little bit too, too long. It was one of the challenges to really protect ourselves from the outside world. And the outside world was indeed the partners you work with, the customers you work with, some orange, some red, maybe we even have some red partners, uh, some green of them. And they all influence you continuously. Even 
co-workers going home in the evening and talk to their partners and they say, yeah, this, this was my day at work, but this partner also came home from their work, which is maybe an orange company, and there's a conflict. They, they don't get it. Um, and that's why, and that's a bit on my role in, in setting up the uh, corporations with, with partnerships and, and so on. I, I, I call a supplier also a partner. Before we sign up anything we are with a partner or supplier, like a social office, like a leasing company, like an accountant, like a legal office, like uh, all the external things you do, I always go there and also pitch to them how we work, why we do this, what's our vision, mission, do they agree a little bit with our values? Because when we know this, that they're completely different, then we will look at different partners. So, so they don't have to be a teal organization. But very simple, tangible thing is to say, it's not because I'm talking to them that I'm taking the decisions. And, and very quickly, those external partners will call me to say, oh, Jan, we need to talk about A, B, and C. Say, no, you don't have to talk to me. You need to talk to the person who is speaking of the role. Uh, um, and that's very hard for them. And, and that's my role to defend this. And you really have to be very authentic on those things. Like uh, I'm getting quite some offers to go to fancy parties, to have tickets to go to a show, to do this, this, this. What orange companies are doing, eh? let, let's buy presents, let's invite the, the founder or the CEO to a certain event because then next time we can have a better deal with that company. And every single time I need to tell them, I'm not saying no to it. I'm saying thank you for the invite, but I will make the invite public internally so anybody can go. Uh, so that's an important role to, to, to defend it from the outside world. Yeah. And, and I felt that uh, during COVID, the war in Russia, uh, with Russia, and then the inflation with the energy prices, people were getting very nervous. And then when people are getting nervous, they're also very, let's say, sensitive for those outside influences. You know? And you need to spend a lot of time to, to this common feeling of safety, and it is okay. And it's also okay to not make that much profit one year. Uh, so you show that, this is a solid, healthy company, and you save over here. But good questions, Paulina. Thank you. I just pass to other people, not to monopolize the questions. I have a question about taking new people on board and the value of, of your organization. Uh, how do you check if, um, uh, if the people will um, uh, align with your value, uh, how do you onboard people to take yeah. the ownership? And what are you, what um, are you, uh, what do you do when uh, someone doesn't um, match to the organization? Let's say he used the system, but he not bring value. What, what then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very good question. So. Um, as I said in the beginning, we are, we are an engineering company, so it's also a lot about the, 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 the technical skills and the education, what people followed and so on. And a pitfall would have been the following, but I learned it in a previous company where it wasn't teal, but we had a kind of a, a same approach. People tend to look for the technical capabilities and experiences first, yeah? And then they get on an interview, and whenever they're already convinced, like that's a very smart person and is very experienced and so on and so on, then they also go into more the, the, the soft skill factors and, 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 and so on. This is emotionally already very hard for the interviewer when everybody is already convinced, smart person, uh, intelligent, a wide education, wide experience. And then at the end, we're gonna say no because the personality doesn't match. So we just flipped it around. We completely flipped it around. And we said, like, first, we're going to see, like, 
personality wise is there a match do you like to work over here is this kind of the the, the, the team that would fit you i do some very s simple things huh? it's like you know this book of course i have to check like this um, we have plenty of copies of those i said did you read the book uh, just take a book with you is the illustrated version so it will take you two hours and and just get back to us when you've read it with questions because you might not like it uh, the real recruiters headhunters they say bad approach because you need to be pushy 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 um, and sometimes people never get back to me uh, they keep the book or they even return the book um, and sometimes people get back to me in 24 hours and say, yeah, I read a book. This is, this is what I want. This is, I'm, I'm completely on board on those things. So and then we can talk. So then they're not committing to the book, but it's kind of a, a, a quick validation. And if they need to take time, it's, it's fine. So we are not aggressively hunting. If people are not responding in time, like after a few days or even after a few weeks and we need to hunt them, then I think we yeah, are looking at our values. They don't take their, their side of the ownership very clear. So we say no. If during the interviews, and I, I have a, a few techniques when, when, I, when I talk to people, how they act on, on very specific use cases, uh, which is taking too much time to explain them. But for instance, one of them is, is, is the following. Um, we all have different kind of company cars, but they have the same look and feel because we have a mobility concept where we can easily swap cars and so on and so on. And sometimes, mainly guys and eh, not girls, they, they might ask like, yeah, what kind of wheels do you have over there? How many inches and da, 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 all those details, which I fully respect. And I cannot generalize too much, but this also is giving a sign like, okay, external, uh, external things, uh, ego, uh, those things are important to that person. At that time, we say no. I'm also very honest about this. I, I say no, not to proceed with it yeah, in the first interview, uh, especially when you're not big enough yet and your own organization, teal organization, is not, let's say, mature enough. So in the beginning, you really need to have teal-minded persons only, um, which doesn't mean that as you grow, you can have non-teal people in the organization. That's okay. But the majority needs to be able to absorb this. Yeah, And we had it uh, in the very first year when we were doing, and that was also the very first year of, of QTL, when we're doing the uh, uh, self-managed wages, that somebody said, oh yeah, I'm gonna ask 20% increase just because I can. And the team wasn't ready yet to say, oh, oh, oh how do we say no? And oh, yeah, yeah, oh, well, they, they can choose and we cannot say no. At that time, I needed to react because if we don't react at that time, it would simply happen. And for me, then it's not about the 20%, but it's about the precedent you create in the organization and the others are going home and they tell it to their partner, say, yeah, somebody came in and said, I want to have 20% and I don't have nothing. So next year, what do I have to do? I'm going to ask 25. So at that time you need to say, okay, you're asking 20. Can you explain why? And what's the reasoning? And why do you think you're then 20% more valuable than your colleague over there? And then this person also had to admit, oh yeah, I just checked with a, a former school colleague who was making 20% 20, 20 more, but he's not happy at work and da-da-da. So I said, okay, let's look at the full package. Mm -hmm. um, so short stories, we flipped it. Personality first and see there's, uh, the, the, there's a match and then you go into the content. So you don't get uh, uh, convinced that it's about the content only, it's about the skills only. And I think uh, regarding uh, Polish reality, it's very tricky because let's say our education system, our um, 
mar uh, work, um, work market or employ employer market uh, doesn't prepare people to work in the organization and sometimes we need to help them when they came to to the organization we need to help them to grow to to this new environment and they very often develop to this uh, environment but still um on the market maybe they we don't have a, too much people ready for that kind of system or people who used to that kind of system let's say in my opinion i don't know maybe paulina have different or, or Martin, but i think we as an uh, employer, we need to um, develop people to that kind of system. Yes, and that, that's a good one. And that's why also to external partners, I'm, I'm, I keep on pitching it, try to do it differently. Uh, and like I said, we, we, we finished the contract. And uh, this weekend, I had to do the official process. And this process was mentioning me, be careful. Because whatever you enter right now, you can be sued if you do it differently. So please call us to, to do it in the right way. Because if you make one small mistake. Eh? So I did pick up the phone and I called the person who's going to leave the organization. And I said, can we do this together? And I showed her the interface of this social office. Uh, so what do you think would be right? What's the reason why we're ending the contract? Because there's, of course, a limited options over there. Uh, there's no option because we are teal and we are self-managed. No, that, that doesn't exist. Uh, uh, so we did it together. It's a ticket again. It's documented. And, and, and now I'm expecting a call from the social office to say, uh, Jan, what's happened? And then I will go over the ticket. And maybe at the end, he said, yeah, next time, uh, because I think you might be fined. I said, fine. But if I don't do those things, they're not going to change their mind. Um, so uh, we, we won a, an award. It, it's somewhere uh, where we didn't intend to go for the award, but it was a mobility uh, award. Uh, it was a Belgian organization um, where we came up with a completely new mobility concept. Um, we won that award, but it was also by working with uh, leasing companies where I had to explain to them, like, I don't blame you guys, but you have been working for maybe 30, 40 years around the asset being a car. You rent out a car and yeah, this is for a company and so on and so on. But times have changed. You need to start selling mobility for a person. And they were not ready for this. Huh? And, and, and if you put it around an employee needs to be mobile and you start looking for different solutions, you will see that renting the company car, it's just a very small uh, aspect of this. And they, were, they all agreed and management agreed and, and the marketing department agreed, that's a great idea. So we went ahead and with the very first implementation, uh behind the scenes they fell back into flaws in the system which clearly pointed out that on a the car is the subject and not the person is the subject yeah and at that time okay you're a little bit upset you talk to them and then you look for the openness that they are willing to change their back back office systems too uh, because they are also learning so it is a challenge but it's also a very rewarding one when afterwards you see that those companies are also changing and of course, there's some economic pressure because nobody was buying cars anymore and everybody wants to have bikes and so on. So they're also uh, making the switches. Okay. Anybody else? I have a few questions, but let me just park maybe one and <laughs> the first one. <laughs> um, I've heard that you measure um, happiness in your company, some kind of KPI or something similar. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? I'm very curious. Yeah. yeah uh, so everybody knows KPIs, uh, key performance indicators, where in orange organizations, it will mainly be linked to did you do more revenue? Did you do more profit? Did you do more margin? Did you do money, 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 money? Um, 
we also have KPIs, which is uh, the percentage of happiness of coworkers and the percentage of happiness of uh, customers. Um, and what, what we do is that after every sprint, what we deliver, a happiness survey is going out. It's also called uh, another survey. Uh, uh, we get so many surveys, but it's also called a 20 second survey. Uh, 20 second feedback. And it actually takes five seconds, but can take 20 if you want to type some info uh, with it. And people get used to it. Uh, after every delivery, what we do, this survey is being sent out uh, with very basic questions. How happy are you? And did you recognize our values, our five values? That's it. And then you can leave a comment if you like to. And because it's so easy, uh, yeah, every week we're getting surveys back. But we don't only do this uh, if you do a customer project for the customer also for the co-workers working on that project. And I can show in statistics right now that uh, whenever the customer feedback was going down, that I could see in the feedback that earlier, maybe three months before, the employee feedback was getting lower. Happiness was getting lower. And this was a direct result of yeah, it's not a nice customer or the product is not nice or there are many uh, elements not, not in our favor. Um, and then you see that it has also a kind of a negative effect on the customer. So now as part of a delivery of a project, uh, ownership of a contract manager of, of, of a sprint, they'd only not only look at did we invoice, uh, what is the margin and so on, they mainly look at we're sending out the uh, happiness surveys. We got feedback. Do we need to react on the feedback? So for instance, we stopped three very well-paid projects because of the unhappiness of our coworkers. They were giving a very good margin. And then you have to explain it to that customer to say, we're going to stop the contract. And then they say, yeah, but we pay very well and we're very happy about you. They say, yeah, but we are not happy about you, customer. Uh, and we like to change also your, your way of working. Uh, but you have to be brave enough to also do this, then stop this. And, and that percentage, we're showing that online within our system. And currently we have, I think, a 99% happiness on customer side and about 98% uh, on, uh, on co-worker side. Thank you very much, Jan. I really admire your boldness about that. And I also deeply believe that uh, you need to have the right customers. Um, and what you do is, uh, I would say, extremely important. And you, in a way, you're also blazing the trades because uh, there are very few companies with that kind of uh, approach, with that kind of mindset. Um, let me ask also the second questions, uh, second question, and uh, unless someone else would like to step in. Okay, let me ask the second questions and we'll be closing, guys. Um, do you have any st statistical data uh, what percentage of your customers wanted to take advantage of this value-based pricing system of yours? And how many of them are, uh, are above 100%? Like any data on that? Uh, yeah, those are, uh, I recognize two questions. Uh, one, uh, uh, who, who would go for that model, which was zero? because we really sold it to them. That's the way we want to work. Yeah? And then you really need to have some, some convincing to give it a try uh, because, or they think like it's a fixed price project, you're going to deliver a product or it's a time and means you're going to uh, deliver time and we're going to pay for your time. And we do something in between that, uh, we, uh, in between our, our own model. Um, if I look statistically, I think 
we are having uh, above 100% delivery uh, overall, yeah, where some projects, and those are mainly the ones where we have been working for many years now because we do multi-year projects, we see like, okay, we improved our way of working and we still deliver the same value or higher that we can optimize those things. Uh, and it, especially in the, in the ramp up phase, when you're having new projects that it might be a little bit lower yeah, on the delivery percentage, yeah, of course. Um, and that's why, again, the transparency is so important. We don't, like, everybody can see an individual project, yeah, can see an individual project, but it starts with a dashboard where we show the overall. How is our overall, and we call it a KPI, success rate. So on a project, we call it success rate. Uh, why is this? Because we learned that sometimes a customer would say, ah, I think it's 80%. And the nature of somebody is automatically say, oh, 80%, it's not good. And then I had to explain, but look at the effort you did because of holidays or illness or something else. You only did a 70% effort. Now do the math. If you do 70% effort and you get an 80% delivery, you're still over, de over delivered. And then we add the happiness. So our formula, a very simple uh, formula uh, of success rate is like compared to the effort, compared to the delivery percentage, and then add the happiness of employees and add the happiness of customers, shake it up, gives me a success factor. And our success rate of overall projects is about 101%. And, and, and that gives a kind of a very start, a nice starting point for the team itself. Ah, uh, guys, we did a 110%. The numbers influencing it the biggest are the happiness. If, for instance, we did a great project, uh, low effort, uh, big delivery, but people are unhappy then you will never be able to achieve the 100% success rate. So the impact of happiness, co-workers and, and, and customers is still having the biggest impact on our number. And that's also, uh, we have tweaked that formula a little bit. I think every organization needs to do it for themselves. Uh, but for us, it's, give, it's giving a kind of a peace of mind. Uh, if the success factor is okay, then I know all the other elements are also okay-ish. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, our time is up. I would like to thank you uh, for today's presentations. Uh, I'm so grateful that you accepted our invitation. Uh, I'm so happy to host you, all the uh, ladies and all the gentlemen. And uh, I wish you a very, very nice uh, rest of the day. Thank, thank you so much for taking your time to also listen to me. So I hope to meet you soon.